Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our class on the Kingdom of God. We'll begin with a word of prayer. So can I ask one of you to please lead us in prayer? Take the mic and Sean, the mic is near you, so you can lead us in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you very much for gathering us all here today, Heavenly Father. Bless each and every person present here attend this class, Heavenly Father. Help us understand your word, Heavenly Father. And lead my Heavenly Father, teach this new topic to us, Heavenly Father. And thank you once again for giving us the opportunity here to listen and understand your word, Heavenly Father. And learn more about your word, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So last week, just before we ended our class, we were looking at chapter 4. Okay, kingdom thinking, and uh, we're looking at how the world thinks, but how God, uh, Jesus, when he initiated, inaugurated the kingdom of God, how he thought about kingdom thinking, okay, gave us a new paradigm shift, uh, a new dimension to think, uh, not to think as people of this world, even though we live in this world, but we are actually people of God, the kingdom of God, and we need to think like uh, kingdom citizens, and we need to uh, imbibe the cult the kingdom culture in our midst. Okay, so we uh, began looking at um, uh, you know the, uh, the kingdom framework of thinking. Okay, how to think. So we're going to look at various uh, areas in our life on how we need to change our pattern of thinking how we need to king, uh, think like kingdom uh, citizens. So we looked at one um, uh, aspect of it last week, just before we ended class. Um, and we saw, uh, you know, we're looking at Jesus' teaching, what he taught about kingdom thinking, okay? And we're going to look at different parts of this framework of thinking and how we need to change our thinking. Um, patterns. Okay, so Jesus, when he basically taught us about kingdom thinking, what was he setting for us? What was he setting for us? Sorry. Okay. Now, when he was teaching about kingdom thinking, what was he setting for us? Yes, he was setting a higher standard by which we need to live a higher culture that we need to imbibe and to follow, and also a higher thinking, a, a thinking pattern in the way that we uh, live, okay? So we looked at Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 30, okay? That's where we stopped, right, last time? Okay, so what was Jesus basically uh, teaching about in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 30, about kingdom thinking? Come on, look at your um, notes. Don't read the notes, just read the verse, scripture passage. Online students can also answer. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 30, what was the kingdom thinking or the higher standard that Jesus is teaching us here? Need to pass the mic if anyone speak. Okay, come on, I need some answers. I'm not going to give out the answers. Give it to Prince. He's telling about uh, the kingdom living, like how to live. Okay. Uh, and uh, mm, how actually uh, God was telling as a king. So uh, he want us to live. So yeah. He want us check. He want us to live like uh, like a godly. Uh, in a way that we uh, pleases him. Like we, when we are talking about this uh, Matthew 5.21, he was actually talking about so many things, like how to live actually, like kingly life. Okay, how to live godly lives. Okay, anyone else? What What is Jesus saying about kingdom thinking in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 30? Uh, there Jesus is actually speaking. Uh, you need Jesus, to keep it near your mouth so that uh, Jesus yeah. uh, he is actually speaking about uh, uh committing uh, adultery doing murder and uh, judging others 
and uh, there uh, he tell like in the world according to the law of moses or uh, according to this world if you do murder it's a sin but he was taking it to the higher standard like even you if you have that thought in your mind it's wrong you should not do it so he's telling like our thinking have to be changed we have to walk in love okay thank you anyone else basically a higher standard of living like uh, before it was obvious outside but now you cannot even in your heart you should have that pure heart okay it's not just in your actions but your th in your thoughts and in your uh, uh, thinking motives before you, you see in the old testament man, you used to see like how you should have these type of type of rituals to keep yourself pure on the outside but when jesus came he talked about how you should be pure on the inside how you should uh, make it inside ready and uh, prepare be pre ready be presentable in front of god okay thank you anyone the online one students want to share what is the highest standard that jesus is uh, getting us to think in matthew chapter 5 verses 21 to 30 anyone online students Okay, so thank you for your inputs. Um, in the kingdom of God, when we belong to the kingdom of God, you know, murder is just not sin, but also when you have hatred or anger in your heart, it is equally, it is equal to murder. You might not be committing the act. So when we, so what Jesus is saying is not just like this big sins that we think about, like adultery, the 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 act of adultery, the uh, murder you know, um, killing somebody, um, uh, all those things are big uh, crimes that we can think of in our minds. But he's saying that even if you hate somebody, okay, it is equal to murder, okay? And then he says, when you belong to the kingdom of God, it's not just committing the act of adultery, but he takes it to a higher standard. He's saying, even if you look lustfully at a woman, Okay, to possess her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Even though it was not in deed, just in thought, it is equal to committing adultery. Okay, so we need to be careful even in our thoughts and our motives, in our desires, in our passions, that it is pure and holy. Okay, so Jesus is saying that we belong to a kingdom where we don't just say, you know, it's okay, a little weakness. It's okay to indulge in a little sin. It's okay to tell a lie. It's okay to, you know, tell a lie to save somebody. It's okay to get angry it's, and react in that anger and say things in that anger. It's okay to uh, have hatred in your heart. You know, uh, anyone would hate that person because of what that person has done to you or uh, to me. But, you know, Jesus is saying that we belong to a kingdom where the culture is something that is very, very different. Okay. Uh, and he's saying that if if any part of your body causes you to sin, deal with it immediately. There is there should be zero tolerance for sin. He says if your eye causes you to sin, what should you do? Yes, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Okay. So he says that is the higher standard that you know you have to live by because we belong to the kingdom of God. Okay, so Nina John says our thought patterns are important, uh, not enough if we refrain from acting it out. Yes, it's not just about acting it out, but even in our thoughts, in our motives, in our desires. Okay, so when do we uh, when do we yield to temptation? When did we give, when do we give in to temptation? Okay, it says when by our own Selfish desires, we are, you know, enticed and we are led away. So we need to be even careful of our own desires, our passions, uh, our motives, why we are doing what, okay? So that is about the higher standard in daily living. And Jesus also thought about, you know, the power of love. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. Can somebody read that? Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. Matthew 5, uh, 43 and 44. You have heard that was said, 
you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy but i say to you love your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you okay amen so um in this two verses what is about the kingdom thinking that jesus is teaching us here to love our enemies okay bless our uh, love our enemies bless those who curse us okay so here we uh, we see that you know jesus is saying you have heard that it was said okay what is he meaning by saying you have heard that it was said love your neighbor and hate your enemy what is jesus trying to say that is how the world lives this is the norm this is the standard of the world that you are used to that you are accustomed to this is a way of life that you are used to and what is the way of life that we are used to yeah curse who curses us bless who bless us love those who love us and hate those who hate us okay but jesus is saying listen in the kingdom of god okay the kingdom of the world you love those who love you and you hate those who hate you you love those who are lovable and you hate those who are not lovable but in the kingdom that i am coming from the kingdom that you are going to belong to which you know you are a part of you need to love everybody you need to love everyone even those who mistreat you who ill treat you who do you wrong you still love them you still bless them you still you know um uh, speak good into their lives you still help them out when they are in difficulties and in uh, challenges you know our churches would be so different if we actually had this kingdom perspective if we actually followed this kingdom thinking and this kingdom culture of loving one and other okay our churches will be so different if we actually were a kingdom community that lived uh, a sim the simple kingdom teachings of jesus you just do good to those who hate you and who despise despitefully use you now for example if you're in a situation you know whether it's in church you're sitting next to a brother or sister you know who's wrongly um, you know um, uh, treated you it might be accidentally the person has done something the person would be ignorant of doing something wrong against you or the person would have done it willfully or you know intentionally whatever you're in the situation whether it's in the church you're sitting next to a person who's hurt you you know or uh, whether it's your office you know colleague sitting next to you the colleague in your office or um, you know at home or in a gathering that you go you know you feel that person has wronged you that person has dealt very wrongly with you has done done things that are very hurtful and what is your reaction <laughs> your reaction is to forgive you won't even want to look at the person right sitting next to you and if you're attending church you're attending a program or you're sitting in the office you just can't concentrate on your work you can't listen to the pastor all the time you're thinking about what the person has done and you're so angry and you're thinking you know how did i land up sitting next to this a uh, person okay how can i get back with that person how can i give him back good or give her back good okay um but jesus is saying because you've come from a different culture you know it's in, in the kingdom culture in the kingdom thinking it's not the culture to retaliate okay it's not a culture to give evil for evil okay but it is very normal to treat and to love everyone just the same and it is possible why is it possible God's love is with us. Jesus has already done it. He's given us a model. We have to follow it. But some people say it's difficult. Remember, I gave you the example last week. What is the example I gave you? No, the example I gave you, the the real life example about going in the car. Yes. 
yeah we are in a when we are somewhere abroad we follow the culture the standards over there we automatically adapt and change we are so careful okay and when we are here in this culture we are just the opposite okay we get back to our old culture our old ways so some of we cannot give the excuse that it's not possible it is possible okay it is possible to love our enemies why is it possible to love our enemies to do good to those who hate us yes the holy spirit pours out his love into our hearts okay so in the kingdom culture love is the norm and uh, what kind of love do we exhibit agape love what is agape love huh agape love is the love that god shows us okay unconditional love but what is the definition for love you can't show unconditional love to others okay love yeah what is the definition for love love is selfless love is patient love is kind it does not envy it does not boast it's not proud it's not rude it's not self seeking it's not easily angered it, it doesn't keep the records of uh, wrong it always trusts always hopes and always perseveres okay now that is a definition of uh, love and uh, you know if the definition of love is in the bible then is you think is it impossible for love to be patient kind not proud not rude it's possible but it's little difficult okay but it is possible right we can do it with god's strength yeah immediately when we react we react in the flesh but we can always react in the spirit that is why the bible says we always need to keep in step with the spirit and live in the spirit okay so um jesus said this is the way of life loving our enemies doing good to them and uh, blessing those who curse us okay the next one is about uh, kingdom thinking when it what about kingdom thinking when it comes to faith okay matthew chapter 6 verses 31 to 33 can somebody read that please matthew chapter 6 verses 31 to 33 okay therefore do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for after all these things the gentiles seek for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things but seek the king but seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you thank you can someone else read uh, mark chapter 11 verse 22 Mark chapter eleven verse twenty two. Mark chapter eleven verse twenty two. Have faith in God. Jesus answered. Okay, so Jesus thought a, a lot about faith, and to walk by faith is a normal part of the kingdom life, and to look at uh, things from when you look at things in the kingdom perspective, you have to look at it through the eyes of faith. okay we need to look at things with the perspective of faith and that is very normal in the kingdom of god and jesus said in mark chapter 11 verse 22 he said have faith in god okay so a person who comes from the kingdom of god or a person who's living in the kingdom of god looks at things from the eyes of faith we need to look at things from the eyes of faith what does it mean look at things from the eyes of faith what does it mean to look at things in the eyes of faith you take the uh, meaning of faith is for believing something that's not there but you know it will happen so okay i'm not asking uh, okay that's the definition of faith yes okay so when you're looking to the eyes of faith that means you are you know it will happen but you don't but even though you can't see it you don't see it but you still believe that it's going to come through yeah. okay okay it's an evidence of things hope for faith okay what else how does the world think okay they see they believe okay even when you see what do you have to do with your mind when king in kingdom thinking we're talking about thinking 
you have to believe you have to reason right only when things fit into your reasoning that's when you are even able to believe what you are seeing okay so but when the kingdom culture and the kingdom thinking you give up your right to you know to fit god into your reasoning you cannot reason things it will not sound look logical you won't have a logical reasoning for it but you give up the right to fit god into your reasoning that is faith please take the mic that's why many people have a tough time believing in uh, jesus because they they have their own reasoning and they can't break out of that yes yes so because people of this world we want reason right and we want to put god in a box okay and we want to figure out things if we can't figure out things you know we just don't believe okay but faith says god is bigger than our reasoning okay faith says god is bigger than our reasoning so when we belong to the kingdom of god in our kingdom thinking is i will believe okay i'll trust i'll step out i'll go with it i'll do what god is asking me to do even if it doesn't fit my reasoning even if i can't see it even if it is uh, it looks impossible i will just step out i will believe i will trust and i will go with it okay and a classic example for this is abraham okay that is faith okay that is kingdom faith okay when we look at the life of abraham because he you know for abraham is it, it, you know he was made righteous by his faith and uh, so much so because we at least we in our culture we have we, we learn so much of god we have the bible we read we are taught from childhood you know every sunday we are listening to sermons but being part of bible college you are learning so much uh, so you know faith can be built up but for abraham when you think of him it was very difficult for him because there was no bible there was no uh, no one to talk about experience of god who god is who is this god you know god had not just reveal himself as well with his name who he is uh, if there is a god and just abraham hearing this voice and stepping out that is faith okay that is faith and he says i will believe i will trust i will step out even though i don't know where i'm going even though i hear this voice even though i don't know who this god is okay but i'll just go with it so in our thinking you know we need to think faith okay you begin to uh, when you begin to do things in the kingdom of god you begin to think faith you begin to plan faith you begin to see faith and uh, you begin to see impossibilities becoming possibilities amen okay so in the kingdom of god you begin to think faith you begin to plan faith so even when you can't see you just plan by faith you begin to see faith and you see impossibilities become possibilities okay so jackin says believe in god's word and not looking at your uh, surroundings okay now if god puts an assignment on your life Okay, and he calls you to do something that is way beyond what you have done, your expertise, your skills, uh, who you are. And when you look at it in the natural and in your own reasoning, when your own thinking, you're trying to figure out things, you think it is it is impossible. And you say, God, this is impossible. I've never done this. I don't think I can do it. I don't think I'm cut out for this. I don't think I'm fit for this. Okay, but in the kingdom of God. you know uh, and faith that is a part of your thinking and your culture and if faith is part of the way that you are thinking then god says all things are possible for him who believes all things are possible for him who believes okay so that is the kind of faith that god wants us to live in and step out and when you step out in that kind of faith you know god is pleased and he will work on your behalf and you will see uh, miracles in your um, life okay uh, just like to give you an example when i went to bible college um, so you know 3 months before i went to bible college i actually joined a christian organization and they said they will take care of my fees my bible college fees they will sponsor me so then i was very glad and i went to bible college when i went to bible college they sent me a letter saying that you know as long as they they pay me only half my fees 
Okay, they won't pay my full fees, and as long as they, um, you know, as long as they um, uh, sponsor me, that many years I need to come back and serve them. But I felt very uh, cheated because they didn't have these clauses or these lay down these uh, things before I went to Bible colleges. After I went to Bible college, they're sending me all of these things, which I felt was not very right. And I, I was not committed to going back and doing, you know, serving them because I didn't know where, where my calling is, what God was asking me to do. And they're only going to pay me half my fees. Okay. And I was, uh, I prayed about it and I felt very bold. And I just, you know, I was just, uh, what, 19 or that time, 1920, that time, you know, I just wrote back and said, I'm not interested in your sponsorship, you know, and I didn't know where I was going to get my fees from. Okay. So, um, but I just prayed about it. And I used to get uh, reminders from the finance office. They would send us slips, you know, saying your fees is not paid. Your fees is so much. It included my hostel fees, my mess fees, my, um, and my tuition fees. Okay. And um, they said that, you know, if you don't, I, you know, if you don't pay your fees, you won't be able to write your exams. So it will come right up till March. I would receive these notifications till March, you know, Feb, Feb and March. And I would tell God, God, if you're not going to pay my fees, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I, they won't let me write my exam. And you wanted me to come to Bible college. So hands up, you have to pay my fees. Okay, that is a kind of faith I had. And uh, uh, in the month of March, April, I would never get any of those notifications. And, and I've known that God has just taken care of my fees. So I studied like that in Bible college for six years. And uh, I only paid, I think, 2,500 something. The end, when I came back home, there was a, you know, there was a, uh, I had to pay back 2,500, which I didn't know. And when my sister saw that, she paid it up for me. Other than that, all my you know, it was seventy-five thousand in those days in the in the in the nine in the nineteen nineties. I studied in that um, you know that decade. Okay, so it was seventy-five thousand, and God just took care of my entire fees. I didn't know who paid it. I just know till now I don't know who paid it. I just know that God has paid my fees, has taken care of it. And um, when I gave this testimony to all my classmates, none of them believed me. See, none of them believe me. And they always, because I always was so blessed, I would, uh, uh, you know, I would, uh, uh, you know, uh, when others had financial problems, I would help them with money. But I would, God never allowed me to borrow from anyone. And I just lived by faith in that Bible college. Of course, I worked on campus and, you know, earned some money to buy my toiletries and all of those things. But never once stretched out my hand and asked anyone, please give me money, please pay uh, for my fees, for my travel, for my toiletries, absolutely nothing. Just live by faith. Because I said, God, you wanted me to go to Bible college. This is your calling. Hands up. You take care of me. You have to provide. And he took care of me. And before I went to Bible college, God gave me this promise. He who called you is faithful and he will do it for you. So, you know, sometimes we think we can be very, uh, we sound very arrogant and bold with this kind of faith. But God wants us to you know, live with that kind of faith. Of course, we need to be humble, you know, and saying, God, thank you. And just trusting him because there's no other means. And I'm glad that I didn't take that half sponsorship because, you know, I would be doing something for seven, six years. I'll be doing something that I really did not want to do. It was not God's leading in my life. So that is the kind of faith that we need to think and we need to live by. Okay. So Matthew chapter six verses, um, 31 to 33, we read that. And can somebody else read Luke chapter 12, verse 31 and 32, please? Luke chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Luke chapter 12, verse 31 to 22. But see the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen. Okay, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 33, and Luke chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, we see that Jesus is teaching about faith in God, and he's saying that faith in God should affect what? Yeah, daily life, every area of our life, even the small mundane, small things of our daily life, our daily needs, even in those things, we just put our faith and trust in God. So when it comes to all these things, 
he taught us to have faith in God. Okay, in all of these things. Okay, um, Matthew chapter um, uh, six verse thirty three. He says, and all these things shall be added to you. So in all these things, we basically Jesus taught us to have faith in um, God. So as people of the kingdom, we live our lives by faith in God, and we need to come to a place. You know, we need to come to a place where we know beyond doubt that it's God's good pleasure to give us his kingdom. Okay, so it's God's pleasure. He desires to give us his kingdom. Uh, and also not only when, you know, it says when God can give us his kingdom, how will he not along with him graciously give us all things? So God is not only willing or it's not only his pleasure to give us a kingdom, but also God is willing to give us all the necessities in our life. He's willing to give us all of our need, but not our greed. Okay, he's willing to give us all of our need, but not our greed. Okay, so God is ready to give you the kingdom. When he's ready to give you the kingdom, how much more would he be willing to give you all of these things? But what does he say? Don't worry about all of these things. Don't let your hearts be gripped with fear about and be anxious about all of these little things in life. Okay. Let your faith arise. Pursue the kingdom of God. Okay. Pursue the Father's will. Pursue knowing the Father's will. Pursue doing the Father's will. And when you do it, he will ensure that all these things are granted to you in this life. Okay. God is no man's debtor. Right. God is no man's debtor. You know, so as his children, he wants to bless us. He wants us to have the best. And I just see that in my own life. You know, um, these last, um, um, of course, when I was in Bible college six years, I finished graduated in 2000. So the last 22 years being in ministry, there's not once that, you know, God has allowed me to stretch my hands to anybody and ask anybody anything. But he is you know, exceed done exceedingly abundantly more than even I can ask, think, or imagine. My cup has always been pressed down, shaken, and overflowing, right? Never lacked anything. Just things even I desired, he is just blessed, okay? And he just blessed me so abundantly, I can't just tell you. So that is the God that we serve. So when we seek his kingdom, we will lack no good thing. When we seek his kingdom, we are blessed. He will give us all of these things. So you don't worry about all of the other things. You just think about how you are going to build his kingdom and uh, walk in righteousness and holiness and how you can serve him. So if God is calling you to be a missionary in some place, Andaman Islands or, uh, you know, Orissa or Bihar or wherever, you know, don't be worried. You know, don't be anxious because he's a God who can take care of you. Okay. So that is about uh, pursuing God's kingdom first and his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added to uh, you. And it says, do not fear little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay. So even of those of you who want to be mighty in the kingdom of God, you want to be powerful in the kingdom of God. You can just declare this and say, God, it is your good pleasure to give me the kingdom. And I ask that you, you know, um, you, um, uh, you know, give me people as my inheritance and nations as my possessions. Amen. Okay. So the next thing we uh, about kingdom thinking is, um, you know, on how about doing things for the sake of the king. So Jesus taught us about how to do things for the sake of the king. King in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35, you know, Jesus has a very radical in invitation, very out of the way of thinking, not the normal way of the world, very radical invitation. You know, he calls people and says, You know, do you want to come after me? And the calling is very, very high and very radical. Let's read that. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35. Can uh, somebody read that, please? Mark chapter 8, verse 34 to 35. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, 
whoever desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever desires to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it amen okay so jesus is saying listen okay if you want to come after me what should you do what should you do what is the first thing you should deny your self what's the meaning of deny yourself your own ambitions your own desires your passions your will okay and then what does he say take up your cross and follow me okay because if you desire to save your life what is going to happen you will lose it but if you lose your life for the sake of the gospel or for the kingdom sake what will happen you will save it and jesus is saying this is kingdom thinking okay so when you're following the king you need to deny your self you need to take up your cross and follow him which means there will be times when you know we will have to lose our life for the sake of the gospel okay what does it mean it means that you know we will make our decisions and choices based on what god wants us to do what his will for our life is what his choice for our life is okay um you know when we do sometimes god's will you know and live god's will for our lives the world may look at us and we, they might think it's foolishness you know um but in spite of that even though it looks foolish even though you looks illogical you know if we still pursue it for the sake of god for his uh, for his um for the gospel it is kingdom thinking so for for some instances you know we know that people many people have given up their uh, big jobs okay and gone into mission work okay or uh, they given up their business and gone into mission work or being pastors or very highly educated given up their jobs and gone in into full time a uh, ministry and when the world looks at them they'll think that it is sheer foolishness okay but th- when god calls us and that's god's choice and there's will for our life that is kingdom thinking that i'm willing to do whatever god wants me to do for his sake for the king's Uh, sake okay now for example you know um uh, you give up something that you really enjoy okay and you take on something that you know is really hard for you to do but you do it anyway because god has called you to do it okay and um, and many people will say hey you know give it up don't do it don't go okay it's not worth going uh you know it's not worth taking uh, that on it's not worth taking on this new assignment but you know you even though you know it is hard work you still go ahead and you still do it because it is god's will for your life and we we see the lives of so many missionaries like if you look at the life of many missionaries they left their own uh places of com- comfort you know when you look at um, um william carey you know leaving uh his uh, you know the the what the the easiness the the good lifestyle that he had and coming all the way to kolkata with his wife and children you know and uh, living in a difficult place difficult environment uh children being sick all the time because of malaria you know he he lost his um, uh, children his wife became mad his the work that he was doing in translating uh, the bible the printing press got burnt but in spite of all that this man never ever gave up okay so we look at the lives of so many other missionaries and why do you think when we look at their lives people would have think this is you know this is madness this is sheer madness or uh, william carey's wife thought would have thought that his his her husband is really mad you know but that was fulfilling god's call even though it looked very difficult it looked impossible but these men and women of god held on and you know they did that hard work because they knew for sure that it was god's calling it was what god wanted them to uh, do okay so sometimes you may say you know um 
you want to give up something and you say, I'll do it for Jesus' sake, for the gospel. And people around you might saying, you might tell you that, you know, you're just being foolish, but you are doing it for the king's sake. Okay. Or sometimes the king would say, you know, I want you to take up this responsibility uh, and go through it. And people would say, you know, no, why are you doing it? You don't need to do it. Life can be so much more easier without you doing it. But you will say, I will do it for the king's sake. I will do it for the gospel's sake. Okay. Either way, you're motivated for the sake of the king and for the sake of his gospel. So uh, sometimes what we are doing, you know, it might look foolishness for the world. Our decisions might look foolish. But, um, and the world might think what we're doing is unnecessary. It's unreasonable. But inside you, you are just looking at it in a very different perspective. You're thinking of it in a very different perspective. You're thinking of it in a perspective for the king's sake, for the gospel's sake. And Jesus is saying, when you do that, you're actually doing kingdom thinking. Okay. So that is what he's saying. So he also says that, you know, um, uh, how about thinking like little children? Okay. Next one is childlike likeness in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. Can somebody read that, please? Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 to 4. At the time, disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greater in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will be no means under the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humble himself as this little child is greater in the kingdom of God. Okay, thank you. Uh, can somebody else read uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, please? And someone else can read Mark 10, 15. Matthew 19, 14. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Thank you. Mark 10, 15. I assure you that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like uh, like a child will never enter it. Amen. So what is Jesus think, uh, teaching about kingdom thinking here in these three uh, passages? We should humble ourselves. Okay. He's talking about humility. Okay. Purity and innocence of the mind. Okay. And also, uh, like how uh, kids like just believe whatever people tell them. So it's like God is saying, like about the kingdom. If I tell you about this, if, like you believe just like how the kids, children does. Yeah. Okay. Children don't reason. They just believe. They just trust blindly. Believe and blindly trust. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, if you take an example for a, uh, usually a parent and a child, you see many times the father will throw the kid up and catch it. Now, if you do have a regular person, that guy is not going to trust you to catch him back. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but a kid will always trust his father because if you see when he throws up, he'll always be laughing because that's how much trust he has on the father that he's going to catch, uh, catch him back. Very true. Yes. We don't see the facial expression of the child changing into fear, but we just see the child happy and laughing yes it's a beautiful example give, give him the mic please it's like how uh, children depend uh, someone like a uh, uh, they depend like they will feed us they will whatever they will do just they depend on yes so that's why we have to also depend on god yes totally dependent totally abandoning ourselves to the security, to the care, to the upbringing of the parents. Yes. You also see that children, like uh, after you uh, suppose you teach a child uh, lesson, like you, you not do this thing, you know, then you'll think, okay, if I won't do this, and if I do this, I'll either get, I'll get punished. If I don't do this, I'll get a reward. 
So you bring that type of uh, mental, uh, the child brings this race that have mentality. That's how it works between a parent and a child. That's okay. what God expects from us, you know, to keep away from uh, doing it, to keep uh, with his laws and his commands. So in order for us to do that, we need to have a mind of a, a mind, uh, like a mind like a, ch a childlike mind. Sorry. Childlike mindset. Okay. Now the disciples were basically thinking, you know, maybe one of us could be the number one in the kingdom of heaven. Okay. So the disciples are thinking this in their mind. You know, maybe one of us can be number one in the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus tells them in Matthew chapter 18 verses 1 to 4, he tells them who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Yes, he says he brings a little child, he calls a little child, he has them and stand in the midst of the disciples and he said, surely I say to you, unless you be converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He was basically saying that whoever humbles himself as this little child will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Okay. He says, he's telling his disciples, hey, forget about being the greatest. You need to become like this little child just even to enter the kingdom of heaven. You're already thinking that you are going into heaven and who's going to be the greatest. Now you forget about who's going to be the greatest. Even if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you should be like a little child. You should become like a little uh, child. So he says, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is greatest in the kingdom of um, heaven. And he says, forget about being greatest. Just think about how you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to be like this little child. So what Jesus is saying is, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, if you really want to experience the kingdom of heaven, or you really want to experience the kingdom of God, and if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then he says you have to become like a little child. So not only just being the greatest, but even if you want to enter you want to experience and you want to become the greatest, you have to be like a little um, child. Now, when Jesus is saying you have to be like a child, we should not confuse it by being childish. Okay? Some of us are very childish in the kingdom of God. What do you mean, what do you mean that you're very childish in the kingdom of God? You never grow spiritually mature. Yes, that is why Paul writes to church at Corinth and he says, you're still babes. I should still feed you with milk, not give you solid food. But uh, but when you look at the church at Corinth, were they really babes? They were babes in their spiritual understanding, their maturity, but in the gifts of the spirit, they were very, very, they were flowing mightily in all the gifts of the spirit. Okay, so they were, but they were still very, very spiritually immature that means they 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 did not know how to apply god's word did not live god's word how to think god's word how to live kingdom culture okay so we should not confuse childlikeness and childish being childish are two different things we can't they're not the same okay um and most of us end up are very good at ending up very being very childish Childish in our faith, childish in our walk with God. We always, anytime we have a problem, we are running to somebody else for prayer. Anytime we have a problem, we are running to the pastor. Anytime we have a thing, we are running to some man or woman of God. And we look at who is more anointed, who is uh, greatly for flowing in prophecy, who is, who can I think of for asking. But we are not in a place where we are you know, uh, inquiring of God. We are not hearing from God. We are not desiring to know what God wants for us. Yes, Sean? Uh, Ma'am, usually you see um, people in church, they'll say they listen for years to come. Hmm. They'll be still in that same position. They won't go do some, uh, something else. Let us go. Let us go talk to people in our church. Let us go talk to people outside. With the knowledge that we have, which we have learned in church, they, still, they just stay at level one. They don't go to level two. Yes, that's very true. That is being very, very childish and sometimes i think god wants us to be that way okay very childish very dependent like a small child but god does not want us to be childish he wants to be warrior like 
Okay, we need to be militant, right? Okay, we'll come back after the break and look at that. Thank you, everyone.